Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining right at the top of the hour, and uh, welcome to this first session of Spark's Open Access 101 series. My name is Nick Shockey, and I'm Spark's Director of Programs and Engagement, and I'm thrilled to kick off this series today. Uh, as we're starting today's session, uh, I'd love to invite everybody just to introduce yourself briefly in the chat, um, you know, by sharing your name and institution, and you know, if there's a resource that you found particularly helpful in getting up to speed on open access, uh, feel free to share that too. We've you know designed these sessions for folks that are early on, um, you know, in in getting up to speed in open access. Um, uh, you know, early in their path and doing open access related work, but at the same time, I know there are plenty of folks on today with relevant experience, and we'd love for peer support to be a theme here, so don't be shy in sharing resources or sharing your experience at relevant relevant points today. So Spark's organizing the series to provide an entry point to open access work in libraries, as well as a refresher for those uh, that are already doing this work. Uh, as open access has become increasingly central uh, in the work of libraries, we've heard more and more about the need for additional support in getting and staying up to speed on core topics related to open access. And we hope that today's session and the next two uh, to follow will be a helpful start in addressing that need. So throughout today's session, we would love for you to share your experiences and your thoughts in the chat. Uh, we would uh, especially appreciate your questions, and for questions specifically, uh, we'd ask that you use the Q&A functionality on Zoom, uh, which will help us to facilitate the Q&A and also allows folks to upvote questions uh, that you're interested in. And just judging uh, by the flood of helpful introductions in the chat, uh, know that the, the Q&A functionality will help us keep things organized for our discussion uh, in the Q&A portion. Uh, it's been wonderful to see the interest in today's session, and judging by the questions that folks have submitted ahead of time, uh, I am sure we're going to have a really rich discussion today. And because of that interest, we are also planning to keep this webinar open for an extended uh, Q&A past the top of the hour for anyone who'd like to stick around. So you know, no pressure to, uh, to stay on past the hour mark, but because of the interest and the questions that folks submitted, uh, and the folks that, the, the fact that, you know, the four of us can stick around. Uh, we wanted to build in some extra time if the discussion's uh, running a little bit long. So as we're about to, to dive in, and before I turn things over, I just want to share that we at Spark are uh, really excited to have the opportunity to collaborate with Maria, uh, Josh, and Will uh, in organizing this session. Last year, uh, the three of them published Scholarly Communication Librarianship and Open Knowledge. Uh, I will pop a link to that in the chat. Uh, so I know that folks will find it helpful. Uh, but yeah, the the three of them edited um, edited the book, and also you know that this book provides much needed support for librarians in understanding uh, both the theory and the practice of wide areas of work related to scholarly communications. Uh, you know, most importantly to me, it's really written by the folks that are doing this work and are you know way too numerous to name here. Uh, I know some of them are almost certainly on the call today. Uh, the book also includes crucial topics that could have easily gotten short shrift, including vocational awe, uh, the fact that just because something can be digitized doesn't necessarily mean that it should be, uh, among many, many other topics. And it ends with a call uh, to contribute to the conversation. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of, uh, of this book is that it's supported by a community of folks producing a complementary set of living resources. Uh, in the scholarly communications notebook that I think so many uh, of the folks that are on the call today will find really helpful. And it really is because of this approach that centers community and that centers the folks who are actively doing this work uh, that we feel so fortunate uh, to have the opportunity to work with uh, Josh, Marie, and Will on this Open Access 101 series. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Josh uh, to lead us through today's discussion. Josh. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, like Nick said, it's really uh, almost overwhelming, but like uh, affirming and encouraging to see so many people here. Um, it's uh, it's wild to me to sit in front of you and have this opportunity and to have Nick introduce us and our work that way. Like about 10 years ago, I attended the Spark um, meeting in Kansas City 
as a brand new librarian, brand new, I had a part-time job uh, working on scholarly communication issues. And so like to find myself in that period in front of you is uh, an honor and a privilege. So um, I do want to note before diving in um, that the slides are linked on the, the on the slide um, there, tinyurl.com OA slash OA 101 foundations, I think Will uh, or Maria is going to drop it in the chat maybe a couple times as we get started. Um, there are notes throughout. There are links. Generally, um, if we're talking about a resource or an article uh, or something like that, the image on the slide itself will be linked or and or it will be linked uh, in, in the notes for this slide. So we created these slides and openly licensed them to be a resource that you can use to sort of um, what we're trying to do is build a foundation, um, give you a, a hook to hang your hat on if you're here to learn. Um, and if you're more experienced, as uh, I saw some familiar names um, in the chat and in the attendee list, then, you know, maybe you'll find slides you can reuse um, or get a refresher on something or a different way to talk about something. Um, so here we go. Um, this is what we're going to do today. Um, on the other side of these introductions and setup, we're going to talk about the development and definitions of open access, modes of achieving open access uh, through publishing and archiving, rewards, risks, and roles, um, resources for learning more, and then we'll get into the Q&A and discussion, which Nick mentioned there uh, is going to be extra time for. Um, just some, you know, this is a, like, a, Open access is 30 plus years old and uh, it changing quickly uh, and global in scope. And so we just wanted to sort of start with some um, assumptions about how we approached this, this session. So this is a ground floor introduction to open access uh, for librarians of any specialization. We are not trying to produce experts today. We're looking for literacy, not fluency. Um, it wouldn't be possible in this hour plus or even in the series, you know, to become um, experts. But what we need in the field isn't necessarily experts, but just more general awareness of open access and sort of how it's operating um, and where we all fit into that. Um, we are at uh, research intensive doctoral granting institutions in the US, the three of us, um, but we have tried to approach this with a broader context in mind. Um, but like that, that is where we're coming from. And so there may be ways that we have blinders on um, and experiences can differ and uh, we would, you know, welcome um, complicating that in the chat. Um, some of these concepts are contested and we don't presume that we have the only point of view on them. And finally, uh, we believe that open access is a good thing and it must be critiqued in the ways that it is applied, uh, like who is being left out. Um, we can remain critical while being uh, supportive of open access. Um, so. Um, my, my name is Josh Bullock. I am the head of the David Schulenberger Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright in KU Libraries, and I'm going to let Maria and Will introduce themselves. Should I go first? I will, sure. since I'm speaking first. Hello, everybody. I'll echo Nick and Josh. It is very exciting to see you all here. Uh, one of my tasks as we prepared was to go through the registration list to see, huh, where are these people coming from? They're coming from all over. Um, they're coming from all over the world, and they're coming from every institution size, from well, small community colleges to big intensive research universities. Uh, I'm the educator in the group, or at least the full-time educator. Um, I am an associate professor at the School of Information Sciences at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And I also direct the Masters of Science of Library and Information Science program. And I'm betting some of you are alums because our alums are everywhere. You may have come attended when it was the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. And I'll just finish by saying I'm pleased at the interest in the session because uh, I'm always saying to my students, particularly my academic librarianship and scholarly communication courses, but really across the board, open access is a really important part of the conversation. It's an important topic. Um, in practice, you should be thinking about it, paying attention. And you now I can say to them, look at all these people from practice that showed up to, to learn about and, and talk about open access. So welcome. Thank you. You'll be hearing a lot more from me as the um, as we get to our third session. Uh, but I'm here to support and listen and learn today. How about you, Will? 
Great. Thank you, Maria. And, and I'll echo Nick and Josh and Maria in saying first, so much gratitude to see so many people here. I think this is a really important and exciting conversation. And to have so many people here thinking about it is, is really, really cool. So I'm Will. I direct a thing called the Open Knowledge Center at North Carolina State University, which is a fancy way of saying that I'm the lawyer in the libraries and I get to do a lot of the fun open stuff. So I, I sort of wearing those hats, I, I love to do this work every day and I'm really excited to have these conversations with you all. I think one of the touchstones for us has been the idea that Skullcom is increasingly just another way of saying like academic librarianship. And so I, I think wherever you sit in the libraries, I hope this is gonna be really useful and exciting for you as well. Uh, so on that note, I'm gonna turn it back over to Josh and I'm really excited for this conversation today. Yeah, uh, thanks both. And just to acknowledge, like, I'm the principal presenter today, but this, uh, these slides are our mutual work. Uh, the series is our mutual work. Um, and so you'll hear from different of us along the way through this, uh, through this series. So uh, Will and Maria and I have been working together since 2016. We, um, as Nick mentioned, we sort of gathered around uh, what we thought was a rich potential intersection between scholarly communication work and open education materials and practices. And we ended up editing uh, a book together with about 70 other great, great um, people. Um, if the, the thing I'm proudest about with this work isn't our contribution to it, but like the community of people that can get that contributed to it in the way that it reflects a much broader way of thinking and practicing than any one of us could um, could represent. So um, part one introduces scholarly communication work in libraries and the social, technological, economical, and legal and policy forces that shape that work. Part two introduces op open culture. Um, there are four subsections there, one each for open access open data, open education, and open science and infrastructure. And each one of those sections was edited by an expert in that area who worked with the contributors of their choice. Um, so Amy Buckland edited the open access uh, section, and we'll talk a little more about that towards the end. Uh, and part three consists of 26 short pieces uh, that are framed as perspectives on a relevant issue, intersections of scholarly communication work with other areas of academic librarianship, and case studies. Um, the book was published last fall. Uh, uh, in October of 2023 by ACRL. Uh, it's available in print for $150, and uh, at, there's a, but there's an open access version um, for $0, and it's licensed CC by NC. Um, and the book uh, is linked on the slide. I, I bet someone has uh, put it in the chat. Um, as we were working on the book, we realized that a book alone isn't sufficient to advance instruction. Uh, it's useful, but not enough in and of itself because books are linear, they're hierarchical, uh, they're static, and they're they're limited. And so we sought and received funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services in the US to develop and populate a companion platform, which we called the Scholarly Communication Notebook. Um, or SCN, which is hosted in OER Commons. Uh, there, there are seven collections, which are sub areas of scholarly communication work. Um, they are open access, copyright, open education, open data, uh, scholarly sharing, which is about repositories and library publishing, impact, and what why scholarly communication, which is scoped to the whole rather than a sub area. Um, there's functionally no limit to the number of resources, ideas, perspectives, identities, uh, practices, and so on that can exist here. And these resources can be used with or without the book, alone or in combination with other content, and updated to reflect evolving practices and models. Um, and we'll, I'll also share a little more about this uh, towards the end. I, I just want to say this is not a sales pitch. Um, the SCN isn't monetized in any way, and we receive zero royalties on book sales. So we are here to collaborate with you and to support you and not to profit off of you. And I just want that to be clear. Um, we, you know, this is engagement, not uh, something that we're making any money on. Um, so uh, Maria covered this a little bit. We were shocked to, uh, well, actually, this is updated. I, I think Nick said right before the call, there are 869 uh, registrants, you know, and a little over 400 of you actually showed up, which is actually, I think, an amazing outcome or, uh, you know, follow through on virtual events that we all routinely sign up for and then uh, don't don't actually attend to wait for recordings or whatever. Um, but there were over 350 institutions from at least six countries on four continents. Um, there was a quick 
pre-survey that um, that Nick sent out, uh, that 236 of you um, answered, and we appreciate that. 117 of you, so about almost exactly half um, of those who answered are directly involved with open access related work. Um, 28 expect to become involved soon. Um, 91 are not involved, but are, are want to learn, and uh, 70, 79 or about a third of you, uh, of those who answered, have authored an open access publication. Um, the only free text uh, question in that survey was just asking us to tell us more about what you'd like to know. Uh, and in addition to just wanting to know more about open access, uh, you wanted to learn how to promote it at your institution, uh, potential dangers, sustainable and equitable business and economic models, open access and AI, which I wasn't surprised to see. Um, where to learn more, we're definitely going to get there today. The relationship between the worlds of OA and OER, um, if we, we, will, we could talk about that during the, the discussion. That's a, an intersection that we've sat in for a long time um, and implications for promotion and tenure. So if we don't get to some of this today, uh, we will make every effort to make sure that we address it in the subsequent sessions. So the fundamental genesis of open access is arguably the ability to share with relative convenience um, via the internet. So, and that's something that re researchers realized uh, from the earliest days of the internet. So like archive, A-R-X-I-V, um, which we'll talk about more in a few slides, um, it was founded in 1991 and the earliest open access journals online um, in the early 90s. So like this is something that's been around for a while now. Um, the Budapest Open Access Initiative uh, makes clear that connection. So um, combined with a history of researchers wanting to share their works, that's the old tradition mentioned in this quote. Um, and the internet, which is the new technology, we have an opportunity that's too good to miss the free worldwide electronic distribution of scholarly journal literature. So definitions of open access emerged from three meetings that were convened in the early aughts. Uh, the Bud Budapest Open Access Initiative I just mentioned, uh, the Bethesda Statement on Open Access Publishing, and the Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Knowledge in the Sciences and the Humanities. And each of these meetings refined ideas that resulted from the previous meeting as early advocates worked towards a common idealized understanding. Um, Together, definitions of open access that meet criteria determined by these meetings and the statements that are associated with them are sometimes called uh, BBB for Budapest, Bethesda, and Berlin. Uh, so BBB compliant OA, which is scholarly literature that is free of charge and permits reuse as compared against uh, scholarly literature that is free of charge, but all rights reserved. Um, and sometimes that category of content may be referred to as public access, such as by US federal funding agencies, and we'll talk about funder policies in just a bit. Um, each of these statements, by the way, is uh, is summarized in a little more detail on additional slides, but we've skipped them in this presentation to keep moving. But if you access the slide deck, you'll have uh, access to those. Um, so the best known definition that encompasses the Budapest, Bethesda, and Berlin definitions is by Peter Suber, uh, who's one of the founding figures in the open access movement. Um, he defines open access as scholarly literature that is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and reuse restrictions. Digitality enables free free of cost, or at least extremely low to marginal cost after the first copy is produced, You know, compared to print, where there's a fixed uh, cost per copy. Um, being online enters it into the network, which enables sharing uh, free of charge. So the, the digital online copy isn't behind a paywall uh, and free of most copyright and, uh, and reuse restrictions enables reuse. And that's often accomplished via a Creative Commons license. Um, that differs from all rights reserved where, um, which I mentioned like public access. Um, so with Creative Commons licenses, typically some rights are reserved, such as the right to attribution, and that aligns well with scholarly norms like citation. Um, journal articles have been the primary focus for a variety of reasons related to their prominence and importance, the way that they're produced, um, cost, and um, for simplicity's sake, that's our focus here as well. Uh, but be aware that there are also open books and book chapters and conference proceedings and presentation materials and data and code and so on. So essentially any scholarly output can be open access. In programming circles, the idea of free and open software um, 
already existed when open access came along. So those were sort of like themes that were uh, just in the air. Um, the GNU general purpose license is a good example of that. That tagline there in the lower left is free as in freedom to indicate that the software isn't merely free of cost, but also free to modify and to collectively maintain. And that distinction is sometimes referred to as gratis or free of cost and Libra free of permission barriers. We're gonna spend a little more time with that. Um, where copyright is often represented as all rights reserved, Libra seeks to extend rights to other users. So for example, the Creative Commons um, licenses extend some rights and reserve others depending on their terms. Um, the one here in the lower, lower right uh, is the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license, and that grants reuse rights, including the right to create derivatives, as long as the derivative is also openly licensed with the identical CC license. So when the share alike term is present, the license is viral. It transmits downstream to any derivative works created from the source work. Um, Creative Commons was founded in 2001, so right around about the time that open access was being defined. Um, you can learn more about that at creativecommons.org. Uh, and the Open Source Initiative is a nonprofit uh, corporation with global scope formed in 1998 to educate and about uh, and an advocate to educate about and advocate for ben the benefits of open source and to build bridges among different constituencies in the open source community. Um, so. Gratis and Libra is a distinction that's worth spending a little more time with. Um, Peter Suber spends substantial time on it um, in his book, um, which is linked, we're going to talk about further down in resources. Um, he published a book with MIT Press in 2012. Um, and I, like I, I was looking for something in it, doing a keyword search on the open access edition. And the term gratis appears over 100 times in that text. So gratis open access is free of cost to access. You can think of it as any content that is free to view, but all rights reserved. And that includes a lot of the of the internet that you consume on a daily basis. So basically anything that isn't behind a paywall, um, but is still protected by full, full strength copyright. So US federal funding agencies have mentioned um, their public access plans require gratis OA. A copy has to go in a public repository, but it doesn't have to be openly licensed. Libra OA is free of cost to access and free of some permission barriers. So Libra content generally uses an open license like a Creative Commons license to extend some rights to users, such as the right create, to create derivatives or to reuse content in a different context or format. Um, a non-academic example of that is Wikipedia uh, is Libra. It's free to read and openly licensed. Um, and open access journals that publish with Creative Commons licenses are uh, referred to as Libra. Another significant factor uh, in the development of open access is what's called the serials crisis or the crisis in scholarly communication, which began to be recognized in the late 90s as the volume and cost of scholarly literature combined with insufficient acquisition budgets to threaten access. So this is a paper uh, called Eliminating the Scholarly Communication Crisis from Near to Here or from Here to Near. Um, that was published in 1999 by my former provost in the uh, at KU. Um, his name is David Schulenberger. He's also the namesake of my office. Um, so just used this resource, could have used a lot of other ones, but um, to, to illustrate that this is a new problem. This is an association of research libraries or ARL graphic that illustri illustrates the serials crisis between 1998 and 2018. So you have uh, journals and database subscriptions are the red line at the top labeled ongoing resource expenditures, which have risen far in excess of inflation represented by the solid black line labeled CPI, uh, consumer price index, that's inflation. Um, and library budgets, uh, which are the pinkish line labeled total expenditures have been pretty flat since 2010. Um, so as a result of this divergence of costs in our budgets, every year we can afford less access to the scholarly record, and that means we have to make cuts to balance, uh, to balance the budget. Um, you can also see that there's a sharp downward trend in the purple line labeled one-time resource expenditures, um, formerly monograph expenditures. Uh, so at scale, we're investing more in journals and less in books, and that has disciplinary implications. Um, I imagine many or, or, or most, if not all of you, are familiar with these pressures um, because they're extremely common. Um, 
this is KU data that was presented <clears throat> so right before the pandemic. Excuse me. Um, so presented to us a little before the pandemic, and what it shows is that state funding was flat between 2010 and 2019. Um, that's the green line at the bottom. Uh, the blue line is hypothetical. It's what our budget would look like if we saw 5% annual increases. Um, in 2022, we did get, for the first time in over a decade, a 5% increase, and that's great, but it doesn't begin to make up the difference. Um, so I've included this here just to... Um, make the point that these aren't abstract forces. Uh, we experienced them and they've impacted the literature that researchers at KU can and can't access because we have to cut to make the math work. And like, we're at a, I'm at a relatively privileged institution. Um, so, you know, this problem um, is only worse at many other places. Um, we're not alone in that, and if uh, you have had to cut resources, which I'm sure you have, then you're not either. Um, there's been a wave of cancellation of big deals, uh, often after lower use resources have already been cut, um, and that became a significant enough sort of phenomenon that Spark started tracking them internationally. So um, KU is listed in this um, big deal cancellation tracking database along with many of our peers, and when that happens, researchers have to figure out how to navigate the landscape to get access to the materials they need. And in the libraries, we have to figure out how to support them um, in the absence of licensed content. So this is a study by Ithaca SR, which was published in summer 2021. Um, there's a lot of effort to understand how and why libraries are leaving big deals, what they're providing in their wake, and how researchers are impacted. And reports like this help us make informed decisions in our own negotiations. And I should note that KU libraries participated in this study. Uh, if an institution doesn't subscribe to subscription model content, then the researchers there will encounter a paywall. Uh, this is the paywall for a recent uh, June uh, 2024 article in the Lancet Oncology, encouraging those without a subscription to pay about $36 for 24 hour online access. Um, and it's worth mentioning, again, like uh, as we, we know that this content is produced by researchers, perhaps with federal funding support, um, it's reviewed by researchers, and publishers acquire it from researchers without paying for it due to norms in scholarly publishing that developed before digitality and before the internet. And in this system of, of artificial scarcity, there are haves and have nots, and that impacts authors and readers. And as a result, uh, among other impacts, piracy has become common. So this is uh, from the 2016 article by John Bohannon published in Science that used data provided by Sci-Hub to show that global use, including in the US in university towns, is common. Um, and I should say that Sci-Hub and other piracy sites generally ignore copyright law, but that hasn't stopped them from becoming a primary way that many researchers, uh, including in the US and abroad, um, access the literature that they need to do their research, regardless of how any of us may feel about that. Um, there was a related survey that uh, came out in Science about a week later um, associated with the Bohannon article that asked researchers, do you think it's wrong to download pirated papers? And with over 10,000 respondents, almost 90% said, no, it's not wrong, citing a lack of legitimate access and convenience as justification. Um, anecdotally, I've asked, uh, a number of authors at my own institution, if they're troubled by the presence of their own articles in Sci-Hub, and so far none of them have expressed concern. Um, to the contrary, they're uh, generally relieved that um, their work can be found by researchers who don't have subscription access. Um, but some researchers are uncomfortable with piracy for understandable reasons, and it's not an institutional solution. So we can't recommend the usage of Sci-Hub to replace lost access because it exposes the institution to legal li liability in uh, contributory infringement. Um, so it's an elephant in the room, um, and it doesn't change the underlying fiscal realities. So that's the context that open access emerges from primarily. Um, it was seen as an intervention to remove the cost barrier to access and ideally to enable broad reuse. Um, there are generally two ways that open access can be achieved regardless of where one um, publishes. Like there's not method one, well, it's method one and method two, not step one and step two. The vast majority of scholarship could be open access through one of these methods. Um, and they are open publishing and open archiving. Um, so 
publishing in open journals and or archiving in an open repository. Um, so open publishing is sometimes referred to as gold OA and open archiving as green OA. Um, and in the long run, this color nomenclature system has potentially added to confusion. Uh, I hesitate to introduce it here, but it's almost unavoidable. Um, so we've kept it here for information, but generally prefer more descriptive labels like open publishing and open archiving. Uh, but we're gonna look at these in a little more detail. Um, all publisher or journal provided open access is referred to as gold OA. Some, but not all gold OA is funded via article processing charges or APCs, which shift cost from the reader side to the author side. According to the directory of open access journals, a majority of open access journals do not charge APCs. APC free OA, where neither the reader nor the author pay a fee, is a subset of gold OA, often called diamond open access. And that's like most library publishing is diamond. Um, in the scholarly communication area of, uh, of work, the diamond journals include the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication and the Journal of Copyright and Education and Librarianship. Um, and then in the broader um, field of librarianship, journals like uh, College and Research Libraries by ACRL and In the Library with the Lead Pipe are also examples of diamond open access journals. Most subscription journals, especially among the largest publishers, provide an open access option at the article level via an article processing charge, where if the article processing charge is paid, then that article is open access in an otherwise closed context, resulting in a journal having a mixture of open and closed articles. Um, Hybrid APCs tend to be higher than gold journal APCs. Um, and in sort of related to that, in the last several years, we've started to see the rise of new kinds of agreements that provide open access for institutional authors via content agreements. Um, these are variously known as transformative agreements, read and publish agreements, or sometimes publish and read agreements. And both APCs and transformative agreements have received a lot of critique. Uh, we're going to cover that more uh, in future sessions, particularly, uh, I think, in Emerging Issues third session. Um, but, you know, for those of you who are here, if you've got an easy link to um, some of those critiques, I would encourage you to share it in the chat um, for those who are interested to get familiar a little sooner. Um, there are also other kinds of models being experimented with. So perhaps the best known of those is the subscribe to open model, which was designed for small to medium subscription publishers who wish to provide open access without imposing article processing charges. Um, in, in brief, the subscribe to open or S2O model uh, builds on the subscription model. It, so the journal sets a threshold for subscriptions that the journal views as sufficient to provide revenue to sustain it. And if that threshold is met for a given year, then that year of content is made openly accessible. If the threshold is not met, then the content stays behind a paywall and the offer, author, uh, excuse me, offer runs again the next year. And that's seen as uh, sustainable for publishers and fits in existing workflows for libraries because we're, you know, subscription, we're familiar with managing subscriptions. Um, Annual Reviews is a nonprofit publisher that has embraced Subscribe to Open and they seem to be having a positive experience of it. Um, so here you can see, uh, and I apologize for how small this is, what it, it shows. Um, from about a three-year period, from uh, uh, including 2016, 17, 18, and into 2019, um, where three of the annual reviews journals, uh, kind of at the beginning in that first year, having similar patterns of use, and then um, that's public health uh, is the title that they opened through the subscribe to open model usage climbs up exponentially. And so like the, this is in an article um, that um, a 2020 article in Learned Publishing titled Subscribe to Open, a Practical Approach for Converting Subscription Journals to Open Access by Crow, Gallagher, and Name. Um, it's linked, the image is linked and it's linked in the chat. Um, that does a great job explaining the model and includes um, the, this, this data. Um, I recently had a, a call with uh, Richard Gallagher, with one of the authors of that paper, who's the president and editor in chief of annual reviews, and they remain enthusiastic about subscribe to open. Um, they've really committed to it. 
Um, so the presence of article processing charges and the pressure on researchers to publish has resulted in scams, which are often labeled as predatory. No serious advocate for open access is saying that scholarly publications are free to produce. There are costs that publishers must bear in order to do their work. So if publishers aren't charging a subscription or access fee, how can they cover the real cost of producing the first copy? Um, one model uh, is article processing charges. We've been talking about that. Uh, APCs are largely viewed as a transitional model, not intended that authors come out of pocket, but rather use grant funding or sometimes institutional funds to cover those charges. And there are often waivers in cases of lack of funding, but the, the model has baggage uh, to say the least. Um, for one, open access, or APCs have resulted in scam opportunities. Um, so predatory is conventionally applied to scam open access journals that prey on researchers, especially early career researchers and the pressure to publish that they're under to charge APCs without any substantive review or real investment in research communication, despite claims otherwise. They exist primarily to charge APCs and they use subterfuge to deceive, auth deceive authors and readers. And the best tool that I'm aware of um, for avoiding pre predatory publishers is uh, Think Check Submit, which is available at thinkchecksubmit.org. Rather than providing a simplistic list of good or bad journals, this tool provides um, a framework for evaluating any journal. It asks researchers to think, to consider their goals and their choices, um, to check journal or publisher practices and criteria, and to submit if there aren't any red flags. And when in doubt, it's at least worth further research. I like this because it encourages authors to be critical about where they publish and to cultivate knowledge about their disciplinary options to take ownership rather than um, farming that out to another authority. But we can complicate the notion of predatory and extend it to some traditional research practices. So even Prego uh, agree that the deception is wrong, but also point out that good work can appear in bad venues, that bad work can appear in good venues, and that peer review and proxies for evaluation are deeply flawed despite being widely used. And Arash Abezeda uh, focuses on the sheer profitability of commercial scholarly publishing using subscriptions and article processing charges and argues that their profit motive distorts research culture and creates harms. And he suggests diamond open access as the solution. So I'm not trying to defend predatory open access journals. I think we should name and shun them, um, but I think we shouldn't apply standards to open access journals that aren't applied to subscription journals and to traditional practices, because to do that is um, simplistic and binary. Um, so open publishing is one way to make scholarly works open, but the other is open archiving via repositories, which is also known as green OA, and there's no relationship there with green as in environmentally friendly. Um, there's a rich repository landscape that includes uh, institutional repositories. KU ScholarWorks is my institutional repository at KU. Uh, there are some academic systems that have system repositories, like the University of North Carolina System Repository, NC Docs. There are subject and disciplinary repositories. I mentioned Archive um, as the oldest, as having been founded in 1991. Um, Archive focuses on physics papers, uh, as well as mathematical disciplines like astronomy, quantitative biology, and statistics. Um, Humanities Commons is hosted by the Modern Language Association and a few other um, scholarly societies. Um, Social Archive was established as an alternative to SSRN or the Social Science Research Network when it was acquired by Elsevier. Um, and finally, there are funder repositories like ERIC for the US Department of Education uh, and PubMed Central for the US National Institutes of Health. Um, Again, archiving can operate independently or in combination with open publishing. So if an author publishes in a closed journal, then a copy can be made open in a repository. Typically, it's the author's accepted manuscript that is deposited in the repository, and the rights to share that can be retained through publication agreements um, or via uh, publisher or journal policy uh, from author addenda or an open access policy where one exists and applies. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, or uh, based on an individual permission basis. Um, if a, an author publishes in an open journal and uh, uh, publishes in an open journal, then typically an, a copy can also be archived in an open repository, and that will often be the final published version if it's openly licensed, which is common. 
Uh, Sherpa Romeo is a publicly ava available and free database of journal and publisher copyright and author sharing policies that's managed by JISC in the UK. Uh, this is the Sherpa Romeo record for the journal Science, which permits immediate sharing upon publication of the peer-reviewed accepted manuscript via personal and departmental websites and institutional repositories. So authors publishing in Science can share their work, but the onus for doing so is on them. They have to take that action. Um, many of us who do scholarly communication and repository work use this tool to understand the policies of journals and um, and the information provided to help authors at their at, at our institutions. Um, typically, we help mediate deposit into an institutional repository, um, and that's how or it gets into them. Um, one of the tools that researchers have leveraged to support their right to deposit into repositories are institutional open access policies. The most robust of these uh, is are called rights retention policies or Harvard style policies because they were first developed at Harvard. That's another place that Peter Suber should be acknowledged for his leadership um, is in helping to develop these policies and spread word about them. Um, a great place, uh, well, the way that they, they work is that faculty governing bodies, like a fac faculty senate, uh, grants a license to their institution to share their scholarly works via the institutional repository. There is a, uh, a guide called Good Practices for University OA Policies that's maintained by the folks at Harvard. Um, the text on this slide is linked, even though it doesn't look like it, uh, and there's a link in the slides. Um, and if you're interested in pursuing an open access policy, um, the Coalition of Open Access Policy Institutions, or COPI, um, which is supported by Spark, can help with that. Um, I think there are over uh, 120 members of COPI currently, and it's free to join. Um, there's a video here that we're not going to watch. Um, hold on just a second. OK. Um, Research funders, both public and private, have also taken an active interest in providing the broadest possible access to the results of research that they fund. In the US, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, issued a memorandum in 2013 directing the largest federal funding agencies to, de to develop public access plans for funded research, and that initiative built on existing policy from the National Institutes of Health, which already required articles resulting from funded research to, to be deposited in PubMed Central, the NIH's funder repository. Um, in 2020, in 2022, OSTP issued a new directive broadening the number of agencies impacted and removing the previously allowed 12-month embargo, um, and so new public access plans must be in place by the end of 2025. Um, these are open archiving policies, and so grant funds may be used to pay article processing charges if the principal investigator um, decides to do that, but um, they don't have to do so. And I understand that the Canadian tri-agency uh, policies are broadly similar um, to to the, the US um, public access plans. Um, in the EU, funders aligned as Coalition S in 2018 issued a, a Plan S for shock requiring that uh, 2021 publication that from 2021 publications that result from public funding must be published in compliant open access journals or platforms um, that required open licenses with a preference for the CC attribution license uh, and APCs are more central. Uh, but last fall, Coalition S issued a report called uh, Towards Responsible Publishing, which is linked in the notes, acknowledging the negative impact that APCs have had as regards author equity and envisioning a future model of scholarly publishing based on open access to outputs and author control. So um, we've covered definitions and the development of open access, uh, summarized open publishing and open archiving and OA policies among institutions and funders, but like what is open access good for? Why all the effort? What does open access accomplish? At the society level, um, Open access can speed innovation, as we saw in the development of coronavirus vaccines. Uh, it provides access to practitioners like social workers and doctors and public health advocates and many others that don't work in the academy and lack access to expensive journals. Um, when openly licensed, it enables reusability, such as translation into other languages or reuse of figures in other contexts. Open access advances equity by providing access independently of the ability to afford access. It provides uh, fair value to taxpayers who fund a huge portion of the research enterprise. 
It enables better public policy, connecting research outcomes with policy advocates and lawmakers, and it seizes the opportunity to realize something good from the internet other than like, you know, cat pictures, which are also great. Um, Arguably, the main benefit for most authors is broader visibility and impact, which can lead to more citations and better career outcomes. So um, I, there's a fairly extensive body of research that supports that. Um, open access supports authors' rights, such as the right to share in a repository uh, or to blog about or share on social media um, for their work, for example. Increasingly, it's a necessary aspect of grant compliance. Um, open access can increase public engagement. It can connect to institutional mention, uh, mission, which often speaks of service to regional improvement. And finally, if you look at the way that open has grown from niche to normal, um, I think it's clear that the future of research communication is open, and that's something that's worth participating in and helping to shape to benefit researchers uh, in particular. But open access isn't a panacea, uh, and there are challenges, especially for authors. So early career researchers may be concerned about the potential impacts of publishing openly uh, on hiring and promotion and tenure decisions. Um, that concern is more about prestige than open access per se, and there are a growing number of, of prestigious open access journals. Uh, and keep in mind that archiving can enable open access even when publishing in traditional subscription journals, um, but that's an understandable concern when a researcher is being evaluated by senior colleagues who may not have a current understanding of open access or the, what the, the scholarly publication landscape looks like. Um, APCs are a very reasonable concern. Publishing in APC-funded journals is expensive. Uh, many researchers lack access to reliable sources of funding. Waivers are insufficient. Um, they may be concerned about predatory journals. They may not understand open license terms and implications or may have concerns about reuse. Um, I found that most researchers have terrible version control um, and access to developmental versions of their articles. So like if we need access to the accepted manuscript version, they may not be able to put their hands on that. Um, and that can be a, a challenge to sharing. And so I, and even explaining what that is can, um, can be time consuming. Um, Finally, the landscape itself is pretty confusing. So I, I imagine some of you are here because you're confused, um, and hopefully we haven't made that worse. I spent last fall on sabbatical trying to wrap my head around where things have been, how how things have been evolving in the last five years and where they're headed. Um, and I, I can say that confusion is very understandable in reaction to all of the colors and models and licenses and funder and institutional requirements and um, agreements and so on. It's a confusing landscape. Um, I don't think that any of these concerns is unreasonable. And I also don't think that they're insurmountable through education and outreach. Uh, librarians and, library, and libraries have been significant advocates for change um, for decades uh, as regards open access. So access is fundamental to the ethos of librarianship, as you can see here in, on the facade of the Boston Public Library, which says free to all. Um, we're on the front lines of the serials crisis and have to explain it to our constituents. We manage interlibrary loan and other systems to provide access when licensed access isn't possible. We have copyright and licensing knowledge. We have un a unique and interdisciplinary uh, view on scholarly publishing that most researchers don't have. Most researchers see scholarly publishing in, from the niche of their discipline. Um, and we've been doing the work of advocating for and supporting open access um, for a long time now. We manage and promote repository services, library publishing programs. We're active in organizations like Spark and Copy, uh, and we've worked with researchers to adopt and implement open access policies and help them comply with shifting funder requirements. Um, we wanted to provide sort of a, a low level, or not, not low level, but an accessible um, ways to engage in open access advocacy and support in this first session. Um, you know, so these are some ideas for resource and uh, for things that aren't resource intensive um, that are relatively easy and no or low cost. So anyone can learn to promote the general benefits of open access, like broader impact. Um, 
We could engage researcher with researchers about their rights as creators and educate them about dysfunction in the scholarly publishing landscape. Um, we can talk to administrators and colleagues at every level, encourage them to see libraries as a, a pivot, uh, as a potential node for leadership and expertise. We can advocate for open open sharing via repositories, um, an institutional repository if you have one, or a subject repository if you don't, and help them navigate the rights issues like when when can they share uh, and in which version. Um, we might consider hosting events um, such as for Open Access Week, which occurs every October. Uh, the theme this year and last year um, is community over commercialization, which I think is a really good one. Um, that could be as simple as a brown bag lunch and learn or a local panel or maybe a virtual speaker. Um, if hosting a local event is out of reach, then you could share information about other events. Um, for example, Kennesaw State University in Georgia usually has a really rich open access week program um, and I think generally invite anyone to attend virtually and the schedule for last year is in the slides. Okay, so we're getting uh, down to resources and then Q&A. Um, so I've mentioned this a couple times. Um, this is Open Access by Peter Suber. It was published in 2012 by MIT Press. Uh, there's a free version online linked there. Um, the print version is not expensive. Uh, I reread it. This was the book that uh, my boss at FSU, Micah Vandegrift, put in my hand the very first day I started in the part-time position there. Um, it's very consumable. Um, it's foundational. It, he wrote it, he says, for busy people. Um, so that's a resource um, that's a pretty quick and excellent introductory read. Um, and I reread it uh, while traveling this last week. And at 12 years old, it holds up remarkably well. Um, as uh, Nick mentioned, and as uh, we mentioned at the top of this presentation, uh, Will and Maria and I co-edited an open book that was published by ACRL last October. Um, uh, part, part two, scholarly communication and open culture uh, has a section about open access that was led by Amy Bucklin and it critically engages with open access. Um, it features contributions from uh, Tara Robin, Robertson, Jillian Byrne, uh, Charlotte Rowe, Meredith Jacob, Marcel Laflamme, uh, Samuel Moore, and Dorothea Salo. Um, and then the um, voices from the field section, just to pull a few out, uh, has uh, Teresa Schultz and Elena Azagbat uh, writing about open access and um, accessibility. Um, Jenny Rose Halperin on open access in the humanities. Uh, Allison Moore and Jennifer Zerke on uh, an open access policy at Simon Fraser University, um, evaluating it. Carla Myers on what we can learn from failure. Uh, Carrie Sewell and Jean Hoover on supporting open access with limited support. Uh, Josh Cromwell on uh, promotion, tenure, and challenges with open access. So lots of good uh, potential consumable content there. And then finally, we already mentioned uh, the scholarly communication notebook, though a collection was curated by Jill Siracella from CUNY, uh, and it uh, currently contains about 66 resources, um, a few of which we think are good introductions are linked in the, the notes of this slide, along with a blog post by Jill about the collection um, and another post for how you contribute, how you can contribute resources to the SCN, which we actively welcome. So if you're a scholarly communication librarian or you have created content that is appropriate for teaching about scholarly communication, uh, topics, including open access, we would love to hear from you and to host that in the SCN. Uh, and finally, the ACRL Scholarly Communication Toolkit is very useful, very consumable. I hadn't looked at it for a while, um, but was looking at it in the last 24 hours. Um, and there's lots of content there um, that I think is excellent for anyone at any level um, to sort of um, get updated and learn more. Um, these slides are intended to be a resource. Like I mentioned at the beginning, everything is linked uh, and we're running out of time. So luckily uh, have some time left uh, or the the um, extra 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, Marie or Will, I think you were gonna introduce the next session. Yeah, just very briefly. First, thank you, Josh, for that excellent overview. In two weeks, we're gonna come back and take this excellent high level 
uh, sort of discussion that Josh has provided and bring it to the ground with a series of specific case studies that demonstrate what it looks like to put some of these ideas into practice in the context of a diverse set of institutions. So this is how a big R1 is doing it. This is how a community college is doing it. This is how a regional institution is doing it, etc. So we're really, really excited for that conversation in two weeks. Uh, and then two weeks after that, Maria is going to lead session three. Yeah, hi. Phew, I was thinking I've been working in this field just about as long as we've been talking about open access since I was a librarian in practice in the late 90s. Um, and that still felt like a whirlwind tour. Uh, so I understand completely if you're like, oh, I do still need to catch up, but I hope it produced, it introduced some concepts that we can build on in our uh, next couple of sessions. Um, I'll be leading the last session. Uh, and when I reviewed the questions that the people who had done the uh, pre-survey submitted, my favorite was, it was like, what do you want to know about open access? My favorite was, why is it so complicated? I was like, yep, that's that's what we're going to be talking about in session three. Uh, because the as Josh has indicated, the landscape changes very quickly. It's a very fast moving area. Um, and so we'll be talking about some of the barriers to adoption, some of the challenges that open access advocates face and also how quickly we have to shift uh, we've been talking among ourselves about what things to focus on there's been artificial intelligence of course uh there's been the introduction of the widespread now introduction of transformative agreements how transformative are they uh the increasing discourse around diamond open access including the uh, endorsement by unesco of, of diamond open access and the fact that the open access models were really created with the uh, with the scholarly journal article, particularly the scientific journal article in mind. And now we have a lot of things that we want to produce, share, consume, uh, is uh, data and educational resources and multimedia, digital humanities products. And does open access apply to those in the same way? So those are the kinds of things that we'll be talking about in the final session. And if you have ideas about um, emerging issues or complications uh, or complexities in the next few weeks, uh, get in touch with us. We, we can consider uh, including them in the next session. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you all. And I'll say, I think our next slide is about questions, and there has been a really, really active and robust conversation, both in chat and in the Q&A feature. Um, I've saved a couple from Q&A that I thought would be really good for us to talk about together, but I want to, one, give Josh a, a chance to sort of close up and then open up the floor and see who's got a really, really burning question as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, Will, um, and thanks to everyone. I haven't, yeah, I find it impossible to monitor the chat and and present. So I was just kind of quickly um, skimming and see that you all were really active, which is great. Um, just thanks to Spark for giving us the platform. Uh, thanks to you all for attending. Uh, please do grab these slides and uh, make use of them as you see fit. And then happy to either, you know, like us, I. Put these slide these questions from the slide um, from the survey. We can dive into these, or we can get into the Q and A function. Um, but please do use that Q and A function, just because there's so much activity in the chat that we want to make sure we um, we see the actual questions. Don't be don't feel shy if you need to leave, but we'd love to have you hang around and talk. Whatever works with the or we all have busy work schedules. We know. Yeah, totally. And as you know, folks are needing to hop out at the, the top of the hour, um, I'll also just say when you leave, uh, there should be a survey that auto populates and your feedback would be really helpful, both about the session, but also around sort of this larger you know, issue of better supporting, uh, you know, folks that are doing work uh, related to open access in libraries. So, you know, really appreciate your your feedback on uh, in that that area. Um, and yeah, happy to to stay on. To, to address questions that, that folks have, uh, you know, for the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes for anybody that wants to stay. But again, to Maria's point, uh, no pressure. Uh, and appreciate the uh, virtual applause from Zoom. It's like my favorite Zoom functionality. <laughs> uh, Will, since you were like active uh, in answering questions, I'm curious if there was, you know, any of the, the questions that you were responding to that felt like a good jumping off point. 
Uh, yeah, I, one, one that I sort of flagged and said that's a good one to discuss live is from Nancy Adams. She asks, I'm interested in hearing speakers' thoughts about whether the zero embargo for the NIH-funded publications will actually become law and what they think will happen at the research level if when it does. So Maria, I bet you're going to say something about this in our sort of complications section, but it's a sense of like, what is the near-term future hold, especially given that there's this, this existing policy that's been sort of contested in different ways and might change some of the things that we've been talking about? So I wanted to elevate that one and see what people thought. And Nick, you may, you probably have your fingers on the pulse of policy as much as anybody does here. So maybe I'll, I'll pass the baton first to you and then invite other folks as well. Well, uh, at least uh, I've, got, I've got smart colleagues that are uh, every bit, if not more informed on these things, but yeah, happy to take a, a first crack at, at uh, Nancy's question, which is a great one. And you know, I think the most important thing to emphasize there, um, you know, is that it's not a question about whether those policies will, you know, become law. The policies are being developed as we speak and are being rolled out, um, uh, you know, by agencies. So, you know, in 2022, OSTP directed federal agencies to develop uh, plans for policies uh, that would, you know, strengthen, um, you know, the, the 2022, 2012 approach, essentially, you know, eliminating the embargo period um, you know, and strengthening their approach, um, you know, to making available articles available immediately with fewer restrictions. Um, and so, you know, now, you know, uh, closing in on two years from uh, the 2022 memo, uh, you know, we've seen the plans from, you know, uh, a large number of agencies essentially setting out, you know, what, what their plan is for implementing uh, that OSDP memo. Um, and now we're, you know, at the very early stages of starting to see some of the actual policies um, that agencies have developed to implement um, that that memo. Um, um, so, you know, like for Spark members, you'll see uh, that, you know, just uh, literally, I think today we emailed Spark members, um, you know, with uh, the you know, comments that that Spark was submitting to um, NIH in response to, you know, its. Uh, you know, it's policy implementing the memo and accompanying guidance. So really in the thick of, you know, the, the real implementation of, of the memo. Um, so, uh, Nancy, I hope that addresses the question that it's very much, uh, you know, sort of in process. Uh, you know, also mentioned here that, you know, as there have been in the past, there are, uh, you know, efforts to roll back that policy. There's been, you know, concerning language introduced, uh, you know, in appropriations bills, um, you know, that if if enacted would roll back that. But, you know, as has happened in the past, the community is actively pushing back, um, you know, on those attempts, um, uh, you know, we're, remain uh, competent in the, you know, in the implementation of OSCP's original direction. Yeah, I mean, at my institution, we've been preparing for that. Um, our office of research is very aware. Um, there's a small group in the libraries that is has been getting together monthly for a little bit just to talk about implications. Um, we've been paying attention to the efforts to block, um, but I, I think leaning on Spark uh, and uh, their their guidance. Um, and yeah, at this point, I expect it will become the law of the land, and that. Uh, we're all going to be figuring out what that looks like. Um, I mean, I think that may that's going to probably differ from institution to institution, uh, and um, library to library, and role to role. But uh, we're just trying to look for opportunities to engage and to be supportive in ways that make sense. I think and that's right. right. And I, yeah. I think about um, when the funding agencies start first started requiring data data management policies and uh both the researchers and the librarians who support them were like eh, eh, okay okay how we going to do this but uh that uh, you know the libraries are pretty nimble actually i mean we we very quickly developed services templates guidelines classes uh, to help re researchers navigate this space it was challenging and it created some uh, new areas of hiring, but I expect that something similar will happen. It will happen if the, if this does become a legal requirement. Yeah, and I just I think Josh to put a bow on that. I think the most important thing to emphasize is you know like that 
it's not a question of if those policies are happening, like they're being developed currently. And while there are, you know, efforts to try to, you know, undermine those, those have happened in the past, but not had an effect. So, you know, I think for, for libraries institutions, the important takeaway is, you know, these policies are, you know, about to be, you know, rolled out as, you know, full policies that will apply to, you know, their funded research. Um, you know, and then that's that's what institutions are, you know, sort of planning for implementing, you know, not whether they are, but really, you know, preparing for when those policies, you know, get get rolled out as final documents and then go into force, um, you know, over the next year. I see Lisa's question um, in the Q&A function that librarians often mention uh, visibility and uh, citation advantage for open access, but when we get to essentially everything being OA, everything has that advantage, which means that nothing has that advantage. So how do, how do we think uh, we should pivot our messaging as that shift happens? Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting one. Um, like, I mean, I wonder about how piracy it like what what that impact that is having like i imagine that piracy has had an impact on the citation advantage the oa citation advantage in a way that is difficult to see uh and measure um you know i mean i guess i would welcome that problem um you know like when everything is open access to the extent that it's a problem that we don't get to say that open access has a citation advantage anymore, uh, I think becomes moot. I had sort of that reaction as well, which is don't threaten me with a good time. Like if everything is open access, in a sense, we've won at least one phase of that conversation. Uh, to me, the fact I'm sure a lot of folks saw that recently Taylor and Francis entered into a deal to uh, train AI using the full corpus of the materials and their resources. And I, in, in a wonderful world where everything is at least, you know, openly viewable and accessible and maybe even openly licensed, I think I could imagine a next wave of conversations that are more around the agency of authors to participate in those systems in different ways, right, to the extent that large publisher, publishers are data brokers as much as they are content providers, um, giving authors and folks in the academy more agency in not just saying open or closed, but like, here is how values led I want my work to be used. I could imagine that piece of it being an advantage that we talk about that open is not just about everybody can read it, but open is about really centering our values in those ways. Yeah, and I suspect that we're still a good ways from essentially everything OA. I mean, things have been evolving quickly and open access has grown substantially in the amount of time that I've been uh, involved in paying attention. Um, but, you know, funders can only impact funded researcher research. Um, there's the re there's the way that publishers react to that, but publishers are reacting that, you know, publishers aren't um, monolithic. Uh, they're large and small and for profit and not not for profit. Um, and there's all kinds of re uh, of ways of incorporating or resisting um, uh, open access and um like yeah not all research is funded um it varies in disciplines um you know i i could be proven wrong but i suspect we're still a ways from that horizon i also just to flag it from the chat really appreciate john martin's point that you know the advantage we're talking about is over you know closed publication models mm -hmm. you know i've seen some people start to reframe, you know, sort of the open access citation advantage, um, you know, as a, you know, closed publication citation disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as open just becomes the norm, you know, that's another way to, to think about it, um, you know, that just flagging that there's a disadvantage, you know, that you'll face if your research isn't available to as wide an audience. Um, you know, so I think that that's part of the shift. But like you said, uh, you know, totally agree that, you know, like these are the, the good problems to, to have. The the other question that's currently there um, by Christopher, uh, outside of open access publishing, can you speak to the to uh, researcher ideas on the 
on benefits of OA and instruction, for example, instructors selecting OA readings in their classes instead of or in addition to paywalled readings. And that reminds me of the one of the questions here on the chat uh, or in the in the slides. Uh, I've got I've got a lot of like I've got the chat open and the Q and A function open and some I've got a lot of uh, windows open. Um, but about the relationship between OA and OER, um, so I I think the conventional answer is so if the definition of open access is scholarly literature that is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and reuse restrictions. Um, there are a few definitions of OER, open educational resources, um, but the sort of like wide, most widely, most familiar of them, um, I think Creative Commons and maybe UNESCO use something very similar um, is OER, teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or are released under an intellectual property policy that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So the, I think there's a Venn diagram here um, where OA is scholarly literature, like trying to advance knowledge in a field, and OER is teaching and learning content that is like they, they have slightly different or different focuses in their in the reason for their creation. But if you use an open access scholarly article in the context of instruction, then in that application, it is OER, uh, according to the definition of OER. Um, Anita Walls has a really great um, like infographic on this that I wonder if someone can quickly put their hands on and drop into the, the chat. I'll work on that. You keep talking. OK, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, many. So my uh, when I was hired at KU as a scholarly communication librarian, uh, almost immediately, my boss at the time said, hey, we've got this nascent OER initiative. That's something that for a new faculty member that um, that as a new faculty member, you can own and grow. Uh, and I set about doing that, uh, even though it hadn't been part of the job that I applied for. Um, so like other duties as assigned, right? Uh, that's our friend AJ Boston has a, a piece in the book um, that's called other duties as assigned. Um, but like that made a lot of sense. It made sense for that initiative to sit in the office of scholarly communication and copyright. There's a lot of licensing overlap. There's a lot of ideological overlap. Um, there's a lot of like, I would see the same people at open ed conferences that I would see at open access events. Uh, and so a lot of people literally do like straddle that world. We have been straddling that world. Like we, I, you know, the genesis of our work uh, was thinking about like, basically, I mean, I was responding to my boss being like, you should learn more about this thing and grow it. And I was like, okay, I'll go learn what that is and how to do that. And, um, and I thought, like there, there should be a book about, there should be OER for scholarly communication work so that we would all be better equipped to do this work when we come into the profession. And so like, then I, you know, contacted Will and Maria and they both said, yeah, that sounds cool, let's go. Uh, and and here we are. So our, the, our book is OER about open access and open education and open data and so on. Um, so we've sort of been occupying that space. So I think there's a pretty easy relationship and sometimes, like I've had instructors who will call, they'll they'll say I'm using an open access textbook, you know, and like that it's for for me to split hairs with them. Like I know what they mean when they say that, and I don't bother to say, well, actually, open access refers to scholarly literature, and open education refers to teaching and learning content. I just kind of go with it. You also hear open source. You know, if somebody asks me about terminology, I'll I'll tell them, um, and I try to be precise in my own terms. But um, in conversations with most instructors, um, I you know, if they say open source textbook or open open um, open access teaching content, um, I generally know what they mean, and we can have a, a good conversation about it. Yeah, that. That's absolutely right. I'll, I'll say another hat that I wear is I teach a class in a library school every spring and the value of the acculturation that happens with open materials for students as they go out into the field. You know, if you learn with open access, 
resources, you go into the field with the expectation, well, of course this is open, and of course I have these permissions and these freedoms, etc. And I would imagine if you're learning biology or history or anything else, there's a similar set of like, you're, you're internalizing, this is just how it's done. And if this is just how it's done includes openness, then I think that has a really important downstream effect, along with reducing textbook costs, along with, you know, the 5R remixing stuff that you can do as well. Um, but Maria, you actually teach full time. I'm curious if you have any any perspective on this. Uh, well, I was thinking about as a, a pedagogical exercise, I have students create educational resources and then I attest them with thinking about whether they want to open them. And if they don't, they have to make an argument about why not. If they do, they have to uh, think through what license they want to assign and why. Uh, so I find that a, an interesting uh, place place to work, both in the acculturation Will's talking about. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but, but I, I also have students explore the world of open access resources. So, several of you called out things about discovery in the chat. Uh, discovery being, can be kind of a problem or how do we maximize it and to uh, have uh, you know budding librarians go out and like find these things and then think about how they might help others to find them uh, it, it, I think it, it is a valuable exercise as well yeah, the, the, the last thing that I would um, that mentioned there um, to Christopher's question is um ideas on the benefits of OA and instruction, you know, when openly licensed, so when com cl compliant with that sort of dominant definition of OER, um, that definition of OER has been uh, sort of further refined by a, a concept by David Wiley called the five R's, that uh, when we say something is open, we mean it can be retained, reused, revised, remixed, and redistributed. And that's what it means to be open. And when something can be reused and remixed, that means that it can be adapted to local context or bent to the needs of your students or the way that you teach or, um, you know, any any customized to um, like identities of students where where you are. Like um, there's an example of an astronomy textbook from, um, well, well, it's I think it's the OpenStax astronomy book adapted to the Southern Hemisphere in South Africa so that students there could read, could learn from a material that's about the sky that they see rather than by, can you imagine how difficult it would be to learn astronomy from a book that's based in the Northern Hemisphere when you're in the Southern Hemisphere? Um, and so that, that ability to customize, to extend and amplify academic freedom and um, instructor autonomy uh, is like a huge opportunity when openly licensed. And that that's true for open access as well as, you know, if if something is licensed with rights that permit it to be adapted, then as long as you can comply with the terms of that license, non-commercial, share alike, um, attribution, then the world's your oyster. And there's a there's an incredibly robust literature on that. So if folks are interested, reach out and we're happy to share our we I'm sure we each have five different favorite articles or book chapters or whatever about that. Yeah, the, um, the concept is open pedagogy or sometimes open educational practices. Like basically people were looking at the definition of OER and saying, well, what does the openness of these resources suggest about practices, about our teaching? And those lines of inquiry are kind of the exploration of that. Yeah. And that leads into a question that that was briefly answered, but only briefly about how well librarians are doing opening up our own journals in different ways. Um, and I pointed them to the library in the lead pipe article that that your boss Micah Vandergrift wrote a few years ago librarian heal thyself. But that's about a decade old so i'm curious Josh and Maria and others if you're familiar with more recent information on how librarians are doing making our own stuff open. I don't know. No, either, either do I. I'm thinking that I ran across a presentation somewhere recently that, that was looking at this question, but I it would take me a while to come up with the link. Maybe I can have it by the time we have our next session. I, I'm wondering if you all, uh, did, did we pay attention to the question from our anonymous attendee? In the, in the Q &A? That was the next one I was going to point us to. Okay, so if you'd introduce it, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I was just, that was someone 
ironic that it came in as I was looking for Anita's infographic, which you found the article, but the first link I found was broken. I was like, oh, okay. Yep, they're right. Uh, that it can be difficult uh, to do this in a sustainable way. Yeah, uh, I'm going to model vulnerability and not having an answer to every question and say that like this one is like flies over my head a little bit. I, like the, it, this seems... Um, as I read and understood it, um, like these are technical needs that are often outside of the institution. Um, so like where I, I think I could have an impact on this is like if K Libraries is the publisher of about 50 journals. So like if there's weakness in our local policies that is making our works less discoverable, then we could collaborate with IT and our metadata librarian and others to improve those practices. Um, but a, a lot of what's here sort of exceeds my daily experience. And so I, I'd welcome anyone else to chime in. Yeah, I'll say this is, a, this is, I think, a really live question for us, and I have two answers to it. The first is that our policy is always to meet faculty where they are, and we would never say you should use an, a less good resource because it meets our ideological needs or something. Like, I think that's just disingenuous and will set you up to be mistrusted long term. But I do think there's an incredibly important conversation to have about, like, this is less technically sophisticated or more likely to break, not because it's open, openness isn't the problem, newness is the problem, or underfunding is the problem, or like, there are plenty of really crappy closed journals out there too, or closed resources out there, and sort of saying, we want to help you find the best stuff, here's why we think open is often a plus in that space. Um, and when you find something that is open and bad, understanding that it is not bad because it's open, it is these two sort of parallel things that are happening. Um, yeah, which well, is not long term answer. Yeah. And the inverse of that is that something's not op not good because it's open, right? Exactly. Like if an open thing isn't functioning correctly, then like, you know, we're going to lose some open things, but hopefully the people behind that learn from it and we learn from it. And like the next open things that come along are better. Like open things exist in a marketplace alongside not open things. And um, that's reality. And Josh, if I could jump in on this one too, I, you know, again, maybe like grabbing the wrong end of the stick on uh, our anonymous attendees question. Um, but one thing that I think this may be, you know, touching on that's that's bubbled up um, in some of our work is just the discoverability of open resources in library discovery systems. Um, you know, so I've had more recent, you know, recently conversations with some Spark member libraries about you know, uh, starting to index, you know, uh, resources like Read-A-Leak in Latin America um, to surface the content that they're producing that's open within their library's discovery systems to make it more discoverable locally. Um, you know, so I think, you know, that that could be one of the sort of aspects that the this question's getting at. And I, what I want to say in response to that is, you know, one of the things that I'm most excited about this series is, the participation of folks from all different parts of the library and you know from parts of the library that you know haven't you know historically been as active in spark you know in like the scholarly communications related work that that we've been doing and things like our negotiations community practice or privacy and surveillance community practice and so you know i think this question to me is also surfacing you know potential intersections with open and other functional parts of the library you know, where there might be more specific support, um, you know, either discussions like this or resources, you know, that could be helpful and okay, like, you know, what are, uh, you know, really, you know, helpful, high quality, like open resources that, you know, you might want to consider indexing locally, um, you know, in, in your ILS, like, you know, like Relink, for example, um, you know, make that, that more discoverable, um, you know, where we, see folks talking about that and starting to do it, um, you know, I think we could connect, you know, them with others, uh, you know, that are, that are engaging in that or would like to, to do similar uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think the expansion of, uh, you know, collections folks, uh, like lots of people have been thinking about and working on advancing open access and like re relevant issues for a long time. So I don't want to suggest that that's new, but the more people in our organizations who are, literate in these topics and are like see their connection with them the better like we as in scholarly communication dedicated folks like can only push this 
so far without collaboration and mutual support and respect for our colleagues in other units. Like we, like I, you know, I I think the vast majority of people who work in academic libraries are in service to scholarly communication in some manner. Not to say everyone is or should be a scholarly communication librarian, but when I say in service to scholarly communication, I mean scholarly communication writ large, research culture, is what we are all collectively supporting and advancing. Um, and so like that's done you know, in nearly every role, except for like, um, you know, maybe the, like the mailroom, which is also very important. But like, if you sit at a front desk, if you engage with students, if you engage with faculty, if you work on collection development or acquisitions or licensing uh, or information policy or like whatever the case may be, there are ways that you, special collections, uh, you know, like there are ways that you engage with, with SCALCOM issues.